All right, let's get started. Welcome to the stories from a high performing team. So there's a lot of research, of course, on finding the recipe for creating a high performing team. And if you are like me and you really like to read, one book I can recommend is um, the book Accelerate, which is based on a survey called the State of DevOps Report. And they analyze the performance of software development teams and correlate them with their approaches and capabilities. And one of the most important factors among high performing teams was that they foster a good team culture. So today, during our talk, we would like to take that research and show you how we've realized some of these practices in our daily work routine. And we will tell you stories of how we created a community that fosters trust and ownership, how we created a process um, which helps us to stay focused and organized, and how we implemented delivery practices which enable us to create high quality software. During the talk, we will assume that you're familiar with agile um, practices, but please don't hesitate to ask any questions at the end. The way we've structured our talk is that we will present you um, the challenges that we faced and solutions we've come up with. And I think you will see that our agile development practice really helps us to continuously improve on our team dynamic um, and it really helps us to experiment a little as well. So my name is Jennifer Parak, and I'm a software developer at Faultworks. I'm really passionate about high quality software, security and IoT. Yeah, my name is Ursula. I'm a business analyst and I've been in several teams and engagements so far and passionate of on team building, of course. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shofan Yan. I'm an experienced designer and I'm a consultant and had worked for automotive, um, insurance, IoT and the financial industry before. Yeah, cool. So let's start here. So when we were preparing the talk, we had many ideas on how to introduce this topic to you. So it all came down to these four words, forming, storming, norming and performing. So you might have heard these terms before. It's from Bruce Tuckman. He was an American psychologist and he researched into the theory of group dynamics. So according to Tuckman, development of groups are divided in these four stages. So Tuckman says teamwork should not be left by coincidence. Team development aims among others to create a positive working atmosphere and ensure collaboration based on trust. So how do we get from starting a team to a high performing team? So we were asking ourselves, what made us the strong team that we are now? So today, this shouldn't be a monologue from our side. So please post your questions again in the chat. So we want to discuss this. We want to discuss this with all of you. What does this mean? So as a team, we felt that nothing could throw us off the track. But was it always like that? It was not. We went through all the phases Tuckman described. So a good working team is not there from the start. And being a performing team does not come for free. In the last months, quite a few colleagues approached us on our account uh, where we are engaged right now. Like, for example, like the product principle or delivery principle. And they told us, congratulations on your team performance. And we were like, oh, really? Like, what are we doing differently from the beginning? So we received compliments on like, we are such highly motivated team. We are always at the heartbeat. We simply deliver and we are present and always well prepared. So here um, we have collected these 10 statements that we have heard the most often and, um, and kind of have stories around these um, 10 statements from our everyday team life. So you get like 
hands-on experiences on how we work. And we really put the cards for you on the table. Like, are we truly a high-performing team? So to help you navigate and give you some guidance through this talk, we have clustered the topics and color coded them. So um, Shofan is going to talk about community and cultivation. I'm going to touch upon topics on process and design and Jennifer is going to talk about high quality software. So I'm handing over to Jennifer right now. Thank you. I will just um, give you some context about what we do and who we are. So as part of our engagement, we are building an IoT platform for vehicle developers for German car manufacturer. And we jokingly call our project the fullest stack development since our tech stack ranges from working with hardware, OS layer, backend services, and managing a front end. About our team setup, we are a diverse team in many perspectives. So as it's common in an agile development setup, we're a cross-functional team and the goal um, here really is that we have all the knowledge in a team to make our own decisions in a defined scope. We're also a gender diverse team and um, research concludes that when you're working in a diverse team, people are naturally forced um, to take many different perspectives into account. So as a diverse team, we can process more information carefully and that leads us to better decision making. And finally, we're also an international team. So every one of us brings in different cultures into the team. And this is essential for us because our client is international and their customers are international. And as a diverse team, we can just have a better reflection of these customers and bring in a wider range um, of ideas that aren't just tied to one country or culture. I will now pass on to Shafan to talk about the community that we've created. Um, hi. Um, so um, because of the pan pandemic, um, we are in a year when remote, remote working is very common and um, it's especially for the IT industry. So um, the smooth communication and understanding become even more important during this time. So today I will talk about the community and cultivation. Um, um, because we got the compliments that said we are a team, not individuals, um, nothing through our um, team of the track. And we, are, um, uh, the high, uh, we had a highly motivated teamwork and team morale. Um, so when I look back to our journey, I realized we have developed a very close relationship without even realizing it. Um, so that kind of relationship is not the flat screen kind. Uh, but warm, needy kind that will take our time, effort, and probably uh, resources. So um, just like what other side, we, we reflected it and we call it community. But how community contribute to the high performing team and how did we build it? So I want to share some stories with you today. Um, and yeah, Anthony Guidance, he's a British um, sociologist. Um, he once said, uh, modernity brings social roles and relationships busy on individual choice, self-identity, and what people want to become. So we, we increasingly, we very value the role of the individual in the collective um, and focus on the individuals is, is very important step in building their relationships. You will eventually find that it all comes down to one word, people. Um, I will zoom in to nothing through um, um, us off the track. So compared to other teams, we are not as likely to get lost in rabbit holes, but focus on the problem statements. So um, the entire team working from home in the past year. Um, so uh, no crowded commute, uh, more independent working space and more work-life balance. You probably have lots of experience around this topic. Uh, but it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Uh, we were facing many challenges as a team. From several retros, uh, we realized that other, like our um, other team uh, members feel a little bit lonely too. And people feel to be separated from the team. 
um, and trapped by endless meetings, uh, working overtime, and probably under physical and mental stress. So to make this situation a little bit better, remotely, the team is start from here every morning. So we share the mood to start the day. As you can see the lack of feelings. Um, obviously, sleepy turtle is the one that gets you the most. Um, we also have the second one for our female me uh, members. Yes, this one. Um, and it will bring care and greetings to people as they go about their day. Um, um, actually, before we moved to remote, uh, we didn't share the mood to each other um, every day. It just happens to be um, a bridge to share ourselves more. So um, I think this is just a very small beginning every day, but it's, it's full of fun. Um, and Jennifer, I remember you really like this part, right? Yeah, I think I really want to add to that because I, I remember when the lockdown hit us and it was just quite hard to understand how people are feeling. And especially during a pandemic, you will feel many highs and lows. And this um, particular exercise in the morning helps me to um, be more transparent to my colleagues um, if I'm having a bad day or if I'm just feeling tired. So they, do, they can be more mindful when communicating. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we also have many experiments in virtual social time. Um, all team members are invited to free talk every two weeks and chat about off topics. Um, I uh, picked some screenshots uh, in this um, slide. So also, as you can see, the monthly virtual team breakfast provides everyone a cozy time to get a cup of coffee and probably your favorite breakfast to chat with each, uh, each other. Um, and we even create a team Spotify playlist. So we use this playlist in our social time. So you can also feel free to add your favorite songs and uh, to know others. So the virtual social routine somehow provide us a chance to get back to the old office life. So more than that, uh, with the social distance, uh, we uh, even could open our heart to share more and care more about others. Um, I remember we share um, the stories of our um, hobbies, families, children, and pets. Um, we also talk about the vacations, uh, you know, the favorite foods. Um, we actually talk about those things in different ways, uh, like the one-on-one -on -one team breakfast, uh, feedbacks, and various sessions. So people are willing to share this because of their honesty and empathy for each other. But what I want to say is it's also not easy to build a trust hood. It requires you and your team member to be willing to put in the effort to emphasize with each other. Um, and um, we are a very diverse team and different cultures can be a barrier to understanding each other. Um, because Jennifer already um, gave you an introduction of our team setup. Um, and we shall remember we are a team, not individuals. So um, take myself, uh, for example, I came to Germany from thousands of miles away. So I was intimidating um, at first to express myself in front of people um, because I worry about the culture shock and misunderstanding. And the whole team um, I found is um, actually similar to me because many of us comes from different countries or regions with various background. So from this point on, we wanted to get to know each other's culture better. So we host a culture session to, to share the local foods, um, also talk about the language, um, describe the stereotypes about, about each countries or regions. Um, or also we shared some fun fact about the cultures differences and so on. So we host like several sessions to, um, to share this like deeply to, uh, to our um, team member. So personally, I felt closer to, to my team after hearing the stories from theirs. Um, on the other hand, introduce my own culture to others um, has always been something I want to do. So with several sessions, trust grows silently. And so is my confidence. Um, so um, we have learned um, there are 22 official language in India. 
And Austria um, is very good at skiing because 22% of Austria is covered by Alpes. And we also learned that in China, people are not used to direct expressions. Um, ah, Ursula, do you, what do you think about the culture diversity? Yeah, thanks for asking me, Shofan. Yeah, I think like when I was younger, I really tried to travel a lot and, and travel to different countries to learn about different cultures and professional work methods. So now since you are here and also like um, the rest of the team, the very diverse team, like I learned so much without traveling. So it's a great benefit, like being working in such a diverse team. Cool, thanks. Um, so as you can see, the sharing and empathy uh, plays a very important role in building the trust. When we trust each other, actually we are better able to improve ourselves for sure. Um, I think which is the foundation of high performance team. So the community and the people are tie, uh, tightly tied together. And it's all about um, connected, um, intimate, um, communal, and compassionate, and the most important is, is alive. So after having the key factors, let's us turn our perspective to the team. Uh, we are described as very transparent, motivated and high moral team. So what does this mean and what does it have to do with community-based team? So um, we um, reflect it afterwards and we try to break it, in, uh, break it down into three key words. So the first key words is um, ownership. So the ownership um, always comes from involvement. Um, here's a good story. So we try to um, run some um, several usability testing to verify our assumptions, check the overlooked errors and so on to just make sure our product is easy to use. We call it usability testing. So as an experienced designer, usually I drive those sessions, but because our product is, is very technical, um, I had to ask our QA to help me to finish those tasks. So as a result, um, her contribution and ownership of, of the test surprised me a lot. Um, she um, saw many potential problems about the user flow and follows the progress of these issues with great enthusiasm. So um, also in the meantime, we co-created the content and evolve ourselves in it. So this established the ownership. Um, and the next uh, one is participation. So I think the most important thing about participation is adding perspective. Um, as uh, you probably also remember, we are cross-functional team and we have different roles. So the more participant, the broader the perspective um, of looking at something. So we will evolve all the roles to kick off and sign off the stories card. Um, this is um, to just to get um, as much as possible um, at, at the perspective um, you can also see the transparency in it. So the sense are, um, things are all interconnected. So also because of our diverse backgrounds and um, expertise. Some knowledge is unique to the team. So to make sure they uh, don't get lost, uh, we have created knowledge canvas. Uh, so in the canvas, people list the topics they are good at on it. Also possible to seek uh, the knowledge of others. So this gives people the opportunity to expand their perspective and be more involved and uh, participant in uh, more discussions. So the last one uh, is responsibilities. Um, so the high level of ownership and, and, and the transparency in the team uh, makes the team member willing to take responsibilities. So also the team structure and many uh, practice make us have a lot of co-creation content. Um, for instance, pair, uh, inception, retro, and so on. Um, so we are a team, not individuals. Because of that, believe in the people in the team and use the wisdom of the team instead of the individual wisdom um, in the top to manage. Always is our, um, like how our team uh, works. 
So um, on the other hand, never blame the individuals. This is our principle, but the team takes the risk together. So such a, a decision-making uh, mechanism encourage uh, the team member to take the responsibility. So to sum it up, um, the community is all about the people. So we share, um, we build the trust and we care the culture. So we connect each other. On the other hand, um, the ownership, uh, participation and the responsibility is the three key words that create a mindset to community-based the team. Um, so Ursula will take you into the next story. Ursula. Yeah, thank you, Shafan. So as Shafan talked about the mindset, I'm focusing on the process itself and how we design it. So as a business analyst, um, my daily job is one of the things is translate needs and focus the team on our shared vision and goal. So to get an overview of our workload and the feasibility. So this means collaboration with team members and stakeholders. So context switching from one hour to the next, prioritizing decision-making, keeping the team focused and alive. And of course, all that with a smile and empathy. So you might have seen these, let's say, buzz, buzzwords on design thinking, disciplined, agile process, which is also kind of new on the buzzword market. And... Um, make work visible, which is uh, one of uh, the lean principles. So next slide, please. So many times we have different ideas. Maybe you know the show, The Mad Men. So this is creative director Don Draper, and he usually has the unicorn idea. And here we have the problem. So building a shared vision is building a common understanding and speaking the same language. So we need to grow together as a team. As well, several years ago, when I've started working like the Agile way, it was very different from now. I think now talking about Agile, we take it much more serious. We really try to, to look in each way, like what is Agile, what is Lean, what are we doing? it works, right? You don't have to have a name for it. You have to see how you bring the team together. So the solution here is, uh, one of our solutions is the design mindset. So what, what is the design mindset? It comes from design thinking and is understood as a collection of different methods to put oneself on the actually user's world, right? You step into the shoes of the user. So you ask questions like, what problem are we solving results into do we have the right stories on the board is it is this, this what we are doing right so the product fits to the vision and not to the plan so you don't have a goal but you have like a product goal as well uh, the product mindset says like challenge ideas and assumptions so focus on the outcome rather than the output so um, the next slide, yeah. Um, I like this statement by author Matt Ridley, like he wrote some books on uh, about innovation. And one of the nice things here is like innovation happens when people are free to think, experiment and speculate. So you need to create the safe environment. So Shofan talked about this earlier. So, and it is a success factor in design thinking is to know where you currently stand in your process. You need to have like an overview. And, um, and this is what we did in the team. Like we refined our process. We iterated in our process and try to find like good habit, habits on like rotating the task, uh, rotating what, what we do. And all this helps you to build a common understanding. Also, I think from the previous um, uh, presentation with Samantha, it's like it's it's probably not ideal when you do all the organization. So when you rotate it, then naturally it comes to this common understanding in the team. 
So usually it looks like this, you have an idea and how do you bring this idea to done? So it doesn't go like straight from the brain until the done column, it looks more like this. So handling a large amount of chaos, the reality is much closer to, to this slide here. There's so many things need to happen. So most important is there to stay lean. I mean, you don't need like an overstressed process. So you need to focus on the goal and work efficient. And this is what you can do with um, a design mindset as well. Um, I think um, maybe this looks familiar to, to you. Like this is when we stay a little bit more on this topic on like uh, working with Kanban boards and how we can make the work visible, right? So the big bubble is the work we do. Then we have what teammates see. And the really small one is the work we show. So how can you make all the work visible that you do? And um, how we did this in the team was actually like, um, first of all, we went remote, of course, like we needed to get organized. We needed to find new tools. Everybody had their stickies on the table and we, we couldn't really share like we did before, like sitting in a room. And um, so our solution was having different boards. So we didn't want to get the Kaman board, like this is an example of a Kaman board. So we didn't want to like um, get into our development Kaman board to put all the tasks in there. We would have like lost our uh, overview. So we created a few different boards, like one for risk. We have like a risk uh, board uh, on, on Azure. And as well, we have a board for tasks as well for the retro tasks. So we kind of keep it, keep on track of all of the tasks and um, it's super easy to maintain, right? We can create uh, stories or tasks for it on the board. Then in our daily flow, we are checking like, okay, what, what's today? It's Tuesday. Um, every Tuesday we check on our tasks. So in this example, like uh, what we want to show here is um, that is also not so easy to build the right board from the beginning, right? So uh, you see this column like ready for testing, uh, which we had created in the beginning. There was a need for it. It was a retro item for it. And then we realized this is not working out. This is not good. Uh, so we really removed this column again. So the board is it should grow with you. Every task and process should grow with you and it should reflect on what you really need uh, in the team and how you can work uh, best. So nothing is perfect from the beginning. This is uh, basically, I think, our, our message here. And, and of course, as a self-organized team, we have the autonomy to choose uh, how to ac accomplish our work best. So we are checking on ourselves. So we create the process. This is also... Uh, really important to mention here that there's no like manager who tells us you need to create like the board like this or you need to have a process like this so we talk to each other and um, iteratively find out what we need so to summarize this like here in a nutshell like some key principles that we follow on we visualize the workflow on the board we limit the work in progress uh, we focus always on the flow and uh, we continuous improve. So we call it like the lean flow in our team. You might have heard of it and there's like, um, like many uh, web websites uh, on this flow. Um, as well, the decisions, decision making process, we want to touch upon this topic here. So how, how we can like have a better plan for, for our weeks. So next slide, yeah. So this is a year, a year has 52 weeks and we have a lot of things to do every week, right? So we are changing the topics, we're changing the weeks. If you think 52 weeks to plan is a lot. So in our team, we just plan for two weeks. We just need to take care of these two weeks. So probably like many of you, when you have a two week sprint, um, you, you just have two weeks to plan. 
So it's much more uh, efficient when you think of like from 52 weeks to two weeks planning. So every single day, actually, you make many decisions, hundreds of decisions. This is like the decision making process. What time should I get up? Uh, what's for breakfast? What should I wear? Of course, now in remote times, you just need to care for the shirt that you're wearing. This is like a, a very, very good <laughs> decision making help right now. So, so there are hundreds of things that have to be decided on a daily basis. And uh, I read this article and it says like humans have a limited capacity to consistently make well thought out decisions. So when I need to make a lot of decisions in the morning to plan the day and to plan the week, then I will not be able to make good decisions in the afternoon. And um, this is how we are organized in the team. We plan it once, we have our routines, and then it actually like um, it it goes really smooth and everybody can do it. Like if there's like a team member uh, on vacation or needs to go to a training or a sick, it's, you are not stuck. Like there's a shared uh, understanding of the process and yeah, J Jennifer's not in her head. <laughs> so, yeah. So one last topic I want to talk about, uh, which is really nice in our team is that we foster creativity. So, um, so in Agile teams, things have to come together. So I like this picture of the Rubik's Cube. So there are many approaches on how to solve it. Like the Rubik's Cube, there are different levels of difficulties. There's one for speed cubers, for beginners, and you can like solve it blindfolded. But people usually get stuck solving the cube after completing the first phase. So one day, a bit after the lockdown, uh, we got stuck with the team again. So all teammates got settled in the home office and we thought it's fine. Everybody's comfortable at home, but it was not fine. Like we missed our routines in the office um, and meeting time is increased as well. Maybe you, you have the same problem in your team. So including like back to back meetings, like no time to follow up, even being late for the next one. And when do you like renew your cup of coffee? You need something to drink during all these meetings. So at one of our team breakfasts, I paired with a developer on an ideation session. So how might we possibly replicate the real office environment in a virtual environment? So the method that we use called crazy aids. So we are eight people in the team and with eight people, you get like 64 solutions in one run. And I want to show you here the board, um, the overview. This is actually the summary of the board. And um, so, so I think this is a great example on like how you can deal with problems in the team. So there are like um, sessions and methods you can facilitate. Of course, you need to prepare them. You can pair with someone. And um, on the next slide, we can take a closer look to the meeting culture. Like I want to show this to you. And um, here we frame meetings. We said, OK, you see like the thumbs up. It was the most voted cards. Like how can we improve it? Um, there are some hearts as well on the card. And it was really nice that we found for us the right uh, solutions. Right. Uh, for example, like having shorter meetings, we don't have 60 meetings. 60 minutes meetings anymore. We just do like 50 minutes. So we can like get up, uh, maybe get a coffee, anything, and then be fresh for the next one. So uh, there are like little tweaks and pieces where you can see for yourself and your team what is good for you. So basically on the next slide is the, this is how our team looked like before we went remote. We were like super busy with the stickies um, on the wall, creating loads of journeys, ideas, plans, um, trying to analyze and figure things out. So, so one of our first challenges was, was actually starting the team, right? This is like, how can you start a team and then become a performing team? So we started this engagement, this project like from scratch and we didn't have much time for the inception as well. There were like two new 
team members, new joiners in ThoughtWorks, and we wanted to give them the best start ever in ThoughtWorks. So how can you like mix all these uh, problems into a nice working flow? So of course, like we started with uh, the ways of working session and we had decided on having like daily sessions, like after the daily have a 30 minutes ways of working session instead of like, let's say a two or three hours meeting to figure everything out what we want in a team. So we kind of like had this every day leading up to the inception and then we kind of handled like um, all sides um, of like becoming a team, preparing for the inception and slowly but surely grow together. So these uh, were all my insights, my stories from the team as a summary, um, mainly for the process is to foster creativity, having like a design mind mindset, like working agile, but disciplined. And uh, of course, um, the ways of working and the shared vision. And for the working software, um, I'm handing over to Jennifer now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ursula. Okay, then let me talk about the final three reasons that make us a high performing team, namely our delivery practice, our feedback culture, and um, the fact that we work uh, solution oriented. So let's start with the latter. So what does it mean? It means that we tend to focus um, on the problem statement. We focus on um, creating working software with every commit, and we're not as likely to um, get lost in rabbit holes. So maybe you know this uh, situation, um, especially during my past work experience, um, a big part was usually fixing bugs during a sprint, especially after a big release. So someone would find a bug um, in production and uh, developers had to go ahead and fix them straight away under a lot of pressure. And then of course you have to push it to production as soon as possible. You might not test every edge case and then the bugs just end up multiplying. So the problem really is that um, the later you discover a bug in your software development cycle, the more um, expensive it becomes, especially when you're working in the automotive industry. So what can we do to escape this bug fixing hell? To summarize, um, if you look at this graph, we need to enable the team to discover and avoid bugs as early as possible because um, fixing bugs is stressful for me as a developer, but it's also expensive for the organization. I think also you had a good story how we actually avoid bugs um, in the design stage. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so what we do in the team is uh, the Tres Amigos concept where like the business analyst meets the tester and the developer and uh, we analyze a story together. Um, so you can build the shared understanding of the story you get like three times more questions than you would have alone and it's why you prepared for the next stage for example like the story time or estimation where you present the story to uh, the next um, um, developers so yeah this is our approach thank you so this is how or at least this is one approach how we try to avoid bugs in the design stage and what can we do to really focus on quality during our development stage? So what we do usually is a test driven development. So that means uh, we write a failing test, uh, we implement the codes to make the test pass, and then finally we refactor um, to make our code more readable. But let me tell you about the one user story where we decided not to do a test driven development. So the user story starts with a classic CI-CD pipeline, as you can see here. A developer commits a change, um, the pipeline builds, runs tests, and the thing gets deployed. Um, our users required a more complex uh, pipeline, and we wanted to also um, abstract uh, some of the steps to maintain them centrally. So what we did um, naturally is uh, we did something like this. Uh, we abstracted. Um, the code into a template that our users could use. So it came to the question, um, how are we going to test this? 
And there was phrases like, oh, it's just copying, pasting it to a template. Um, it's not complicated at all. So in the end, we decided after some back and forth, we decided to not write any unit tests for this. So the way as a developer, the way you had to test um, your changes um, in a template is you would push the code to the template, you'd watch the pipeline run, and then the thing comes crashing down on you every step. And it really took a long time. And there was very, there's really silly bugs everywhere. And it was a stressful time for sure to be a developer on this user story. Um, but it was also, you know, it gets expensive because any other work was um, delayed because we were working on the st user story. So let's wind back to the time when we were asking ourselves, um, how are we going to test this? We, what test-driven development really does is it forces you to reflect on your implementation. So even if you can't write tests for the whole C pipeline or the whole template, we could have ex extracted some, some codes and write unit tests for that. And the bottom line really is it sometimes, like test-driven development, sometimes feels like it's going to slow you down. Um, maybe it feels like it's not feasible and it really takes some discipline. But if you start your um, implementation by asking how it can be tested, it gives you the chance to carefully pick from several design choices and it helps you to uncover bugs early on in your development phase. And also on the plus side, um, having a good test coverage enables um, developers to do refactorings with confidence. So gladly we really learn from our mistakes and we really do test-driven development all the time. But let me tell you about another challenge um, that we've overcome with our delivery practice. So when I started our current engagement, um, I had zero experience working in Golang, the programming language that we use. And also the domain was very new to me and I've never worked with hardware before. So what, what do you do with such a person? Um, what we do in our team is pair programming. So that means two people uh, work on a user story or a small feature together at all times. And through pair programming, I was really able to catch up quickly from someone else's expertise. Our client actually gave us this feedback that, that their company usually takes months to onboard a new joiner. And in our team, our developer could start coding straight away with the pair. And I think if you look at this picture, I think it really um, also shows that you're building a product together. And I think this is where also the community perspectives come, comes in also. But as life goes on, um, the next challenge was just waiting around the corner. So we really found that pairing works, um, but there were still some knowledge silos in the team. And as it happens, you realize this when the two people who can work with infrastructure aren't there to do the infrastructure work. So we um, tried to solve this problem and um, what we came up with um, was we could do pair rotation. So what this means is that I work on a user story with my pair and after a day or two, um, the, my pair rotates out and someone else joins. And something really valuable happens here. You get these two people um, with two modes of thinking, two different perspectives and experiences, and you have to join into one um, to come up with a solution. And while I'm onboarding my new pair, I describe the code base, I reason about the implementation, um, and it gives me the chance to validate um, what I've been working on with my other pair. So through pair programming and rotating our pairs constantly, um, we managed to avoid any knowledge silos in the team and also um, made sure that everyone in the team is aware of different parts in the system. And I wanna um, lift up one misconception that we hear quite a lot about pair programming. It goes like pair programming halves the productivity of developers. Um, and that would be true if the hardest part of programming was typing. That's one of my favorite quotes from Martin Fowler, our chief scientist. And I think it really shows us that um, this is about um, excelling at software design because the hard part is actually coming up with a solution and we see great value in challenging each other. 
And finally, your feedback culture. So I'm going to be honest, pairing isn't just sunshine and rainbows. As you can imagine, in a team with lots of different perspectives, you may run into conflict. Um, but that's okay, because our process is well structured and organized to give us room to have, um, to have times to talk about this. So that could be during a retrospective or during a one-on-one -on -one feedback session. So what I usually do um, is I have regular 30 minutes um, one-on-one -on -one sessions with every member in my team, uh, usually bi-weekly. And we have someone in our team who's really, really good at giving feedback. They come prepared to a feedback session. And after the 30 minutes, I literally I leave with a list of things I've done well and things I can improve on. And then in the next session, we reflect on what we've talked about. And um, the benefits that I really found is that, I mean, first of all, it removes the fear of conflict because I know I have this session where I can talk about it in private. And it really, really helps me to grow and improve constantly. And also it creates a environment where everyone is um, eager to give feedback, may, maybe not only about personal stuff, but also about the product that we're creating. And I think this is really where you want to be. Um, and talking about feedback, um, this is the second time we're giving this talk at a conference today, and we want to visit many more. So please uh, feel free to share any feedback uh, with us. So to summarize, um, what we do is that we validate our design to avoid any bugs early on with the Tres Amigos or the Tres Amigas. We do test-driven development uh, for high-quality software. We also implemented pair programming and pair rotations to avoid any knowledge silos in a team. And we have regular one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions to um, ensure high quality delivery. I now want to uh, conclude our talk. So research and our stories have showed us that um, the community is the basis um, of a high performing team. And then we created a process um, that really helped us handling a large amount of chaos. And we implemented delivery principle to focus on high quality software. And of course, um, there's no blueprint for a high performing team. And the things that work for us might not work for you. But we really hope that we inspired you with our stories to reflect on your community process and delivery practice. So thanks so much for joining our talk. And please uh, feel free to contact us if you have any further questions or feedback.